Open your Bibles to Matthew 6. Verse 19. Starting last Sunday, this will be the third message. And I plan to put this as a series in the website, in the teaching center. The teaching on treasures in heaven. This will be the third message. We've been looking at verse 19 in chapter 6 in Matthew 20, 21. We also went to Luke. Tonight we're going to look at number 22 and 23. The verses number 22 and 23. I've been reading from several different authors. Sometimes I agree with them and sometimes I don't. As I expressed last Wednesday night, why I didn't agree with a certain author and what he said. But when I could find things that I could share with you from outside sources, I don't mind doing it. As long as they stay in God's Word and rightly divided also. Especially in this subject matter, you have a lot of opinions on giving. Most of the opinions based on giving are drawn from the Old Testament. And as I said before, this live part of the teaching started a few moments ago. What is the New Testament concept of it? I'm not saying to ignore the Old Testament concept. What I've been saying, it goes above and beyond. And just about everyone teaches on that old concept structure. Jesus takes it to a whole other plane. If you really understand and want to understand with Matthew 6, 19, lay not your treasures, yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust do it corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor do corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Verse 21 is not probably the most powerful misunderstood words. when it comes to giving. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And most people just don't want to understand it. This takes it too far. It demands too much. So they ignore it. How many Preachers or pastors you even see preaching on this subject on any given Sunday. Just the opposite now is preached. Lay up your treasures here on earth because that's a God-given promise. That's their message. That's the prosperity message. And as I said before, the disciples that turned into apostles sure didn't get that message. They missed that memo. They must have been out to lunch. And they didn't get the news. Forget denying yourself. It's all about you now. Like I said, they must have missed the office men memo. Because now it's all about me, me, me. Because I could claim promises and I haven't heard one yet that's not taken out of context. That says, I could have everything I want here and now. It's a God-given right and promise. 
Like I said, the Lord might give you more than you can handle. But if he does, you better not forget why he did it in the first place. And without an exception, you were called and chosen to be a funnel to achieve his purposes. If you get blessings along the way from it, then so be it. Thank you, Jesus. And some will. But your attitude should not be, what can I get here and now? As I've been reading and teaching you, Jesus is not a cosmic killjoy. He wants you to have those rewards. And if you were here last Wednesday night, in fact, they asked me, what should the message be called or titled for last Wednesday night messages, message that I preach? Inexhaustible rewards. Inexhaustible rewards. And if you missed that, make sure you catch up. It's an important message in the series. He knows what you need here and now. And scripture is loaded with promises that take care of you here and now. But he wants you to have an attitude and a viewpoint that goes beyond the myopic vision of the here and now. And look at the long-term outcome, which never ends. And what you do here and now and how you lay it up there, as I preached last Wednesday night and read to you, your riches sooner or later would run out here and now. But there, you cannot exhaust. That reward will keep on benefiting, benefiting you throughout eternity. If you missed it, you need to listen to it. But lay up yourself treasures in heaven with neither moth nor rust to a corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart. The Greek word is cardia. It means the center and seat of spiritual life. For where your treasure is, there will your, in a sense, your spiritual life will be also. Let me continue reading where I left off. Christ's words were direct and profound. And listen, I understand. I'm probably going to tune a lot of you out. Because New Testament giving, and I know what's preached out there and what most people assumed. Well, giving was of the law, and therefore the law is fulfilled, no longer have to give. Are you not reading? Are you not listening to what Jesus is trying to communicate? You have become deaf and blind. Deliberately. And I realize a lot of you are going to tune out. This will probably sort the next few weeks. who the continuing participants will be, not only now, in the next few weeks, but in the future, as they hear this played and placed in the website, eventually, even in written format. And it will sort their spiritual viewpoint, and it will be clear as black and white. If it becomes black, because they justified to be so, and as I'm going to preach later tonight, they're not living in the light. They're living in darkness. They're not living in haplos, or haplos in the Greek, which I'll get to in a few minutes. They're living in darkness. But let me continue reading. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do we, what do, we do with our possessions? A sure indicator of what's in our hearts. Jesus is saying, show me your checkbook your credit card statement, 
and your receipts for cash expenditures, and I'll show you where your heart is. What we do with our money doesn't lie. It is a bold statement to God of what we truly value. But what we do with our money doesn't simply indicate where our heart is. According to Jesus, it determines where our heart goes. This is an amazing and exciting truth. If I want my heart to be in one particular place and not in another, then I need to put my money in that place and not in the other. That's fairly simple to understand. I've heard people say, I want more of a heart for missions. I always respond, Jesus tells you exactly how to get it. Put your money in missions and your heart will follow. Do you wish you had a greater heart for the lost? Then give your money to help and reach the lost. Do you want your heart to be in your church? Put your money there. Your heart will always be where your money is and not where your money isn't. I got to read that again. Your heart will always be where your money is and not where your money isn't. It's almost like the saying on the street, put your money where your mouth is. Oh, there's a lot of professing Christians. But when the rubber meets the road, you can find out the truth real quickly. If most of your money is in mutual funds, retirement, your house, or your hobby, that's where your heart's going to be. Suppose you're giving to help African children with AIDS, or you're sponsoring a child in Haiti. When you see an article on the subject, you're hooked. If you're sending money to plant churches in India and an earthquake hits India, you watch the news and fervently pray. Why? Because your heart is where your treasure is. My heart isn't in all things of God. Is it because your treasure, treasure isn't in the things of God? Put your resources, your assets, your money and possessions, your time and talents. I'm about ready to sneeze. I think. I think it passed. My heart isn't in all things of God. It is because your treasure isn't in the things of God. Put your resources, your assets, your money and possessions, your time and talents and energies in the things of God. As surely as the compass needle follows north, your heart will follow your treasure. Money leads, hearts follow. After discussing the two treasures, Jesus speaks of two perspectives. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now that's a simple translation of it. The King James, and I'm coming back to this probably in about 15 minutes, but let me read you the King James translation. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Now, we'll get to it in a minute, but single is a bad translation. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, I'll get to that in a minute, and I'll straighten that out. But this is where this particular author is at right now. He gave you a simple translation of what it says, but it's incomplete. And once again, I have to fill in the gaps here because it goes way beyond that simple translation. Physical vision is used here as a metaphor for, pers for perspective. The way we look at life, well, physical vision is used here as a metaphor for perspective, the way we look at life. Unbelievers look at life at a brief interval that begins at birth and ends at death. In looking to the future, they look no further than their own lifespan, if even that. Their vision is pitifully short and narrow. 
restricted to the horizons of the world. Like a myopic horse with blinders on, the person without Christ can, neither, can see neither far nor wide. Bereft of eternal perspective, bereft means, for those of you in other parts of the world that might not know what that word means, is kind of like deprived. They're deprived of eternal perspective. Unbelievers are bound to take all the wrong turns and come to all the wrong conclusions and thinking. If this life is all there is, why deny myself any pleasure or possessions? That's the short-term view. You don't have the long-term perspective of eternity as your viewpoint. It's all about here and now and what you can get out of it. What gives you pleasure? sucking every little bit of pleasure you can in what you put your heart in to concerning the here and now. If this, is life, if this life is all there is, why deny myself any pleasure or possessions? Given this premise, why would they come to any other conclusion? People only live for a higher purpose when they see a higher purpose. So whose responsibility then that becomes? To show them what the higher purpose is. Politicians? News media? Lawyers? Secular teachers? That's why it's not available in the archives. But I preach around a half a dozen messages, Woe to the Shepherds, in the first year of this ministry. And I came on strong. Some of you who are here remember those messages. I came on strong. to pastors and preachers that don't live up to why they were called and chosen in the first place. To make sure, not only in this subject matter, but others also, what that higher purpose is all about and how to be involved in it. All they've produced is onlookers and do nothings for Jesus that are only concerned how they can achieve and what Jesus can do for them here and now. The world's going to hell. And the biggest contributor, besides time, marching on, and what was prophesied, the biggest contributor of that, because that's the way God saw it, especially in the Old Testament, it's quite evident, because of people-pleaser, pastors, and preachers. And you see it in Isaiah, you see it in Ezekiel. You see the woe to the shepherds in our day to the under-shepherd, the under-shepherds of Jesus Christ. That don't challenge you to reach those higher purposes, to use this author's words, and to see those higher purposes. Listen, I could preach a watered-down Old Testament messages of giving like most do. They preach a 10% tithing message hoping that you'll give somewhere between 3 and 5%. Most of you give more to Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is what we call our government here in the United States of America. I don't know what you call it wherever you're at if you're outside of this country. Then you give to God. What an embarrassment and a shame.
And I'll say it just like they did in the Old Testament and the New. Shame on you. Shame on you. Well, they're going to take it. In case you don't know what the Old Testament standard was, and someday I'll have enough time, probably not in this series. When you break down the tithing and offering system, it breaks down to about 23%, give or take, a percent or two. Do you think most preachers are going to preach that concept? They, most, they know most of the people that are sitting in front of them will say, I'm out of here. This, I don't even say what I was thinking. This preacher has obviously lost his mind. That's a proven fact in the Old Testament. New Testament concept giving by Christ himself goes beyond that. He wants to see what you're made out of. What the Spirit of God implanted in you is really accomplished, if you want to put it in those terms. And how you get to be to that place of where it's accomplishing something in you. That's part, as I said, the fruit of the Spirit. And some of you weren't around when that was taught. Agatha Sunni which means generous giving, giving liberally, nothing holding you back. It's one of the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit. That's implanted in you to give you that desire to be like Jesus in that case because that's what he lo he's like. And we are to be image in his likeness, not in our self-serving likeness ways. I told you, this is going to lose a lot of individuals. They're just sitting there on the fence. They like what they're hearing, but the demand is too much. I'm not saying you're all going to get to this point overnight. But you better have a desire to always seeing ways how you can give more. And like I said, most of you are stuck in an old Mosaic law system of numbers. Of numbers. When it goes beyond numbers, God wants to see what your heart is made of. Every time you write that check, and send your hard-earned money or possession in, He's looking at your heart. Well, doesn't God want me to have good things? Of course. But your perspective is still here on the here and now. He knows what's best for you. Everybody will admit to that and agree to that. He knows what's best for you. And if he knows what's best for you, then why wouldn't he think in the eternal viewpoint and more than what's the here and now? See, you're stuck on the here and now. Well, I can't comprehend that. Well, you better, you better slap yourself around or beat your head up against the wall, figuratively speaking, to get this concept in, because that's what he dwells in. And he's made you the instrument in the here and now to prepare the thereafter. As believers in Christ, our theology gives us perspective. It tells us that this life is the 
preface, not the book. It's just the introduction, in other words. This life is just the introduction. It's the preliminaries, not the main event. It's the tune-up, not the concert. When you're on a long airplane flight, you naturally talk to people, socialize, eat, read, pray, sleep, or maybe talk about what, where you're going. But, but what would you think if a passenger by the window seat started hanging curtains over the window, take photographs of the scene in front of him, paint murals, and put up wall hangings? You think, hey, it's not that long of a trip. Once we get to the destination, none of this will matter. Even a long plane flight is short compared to the span of your entire life. I think of our lives in terms of a dot and a line, signifying two phases. Our present life on earth is the dot. It begins. It's brief. However, from the dot, a line extends that goes on forever. That line is eternity, which Christians will spend in heaven. Right now, we're living in a dot. Let me just go to the board. What is this author saying? That's the dot. That's life on earth. Life on earth. That's the dot right here. That's where it starts. That's the here and now. Eternity, or let's just say life eternal. Life on earth, the dot, that's where it now. But after the here and now, life continues. Life continues, folks. This line represents the eternity of life. And of course, there is no end point to it. It continues. So what you do here and now will go with you forever. Forever. Like I said, most of us are stuck right here in the here and now. That's our viewpoint. And we can't comprehend behind, beyond this. Well, do you trust? Do you faith? Faith? Do you believe the verifiable word of God that there's this? If you do, then, not, then why don't you comprehend what you do here and now affects everything from that point forward? that doesn't have any ending point. That's what this author, you can come back to me now, is trying to communicate here. I think of our lives in terms of a dot and a line, signifying two phases. Our present life on earth, it begins and it ends. It begins and it ends. It has a finale about it. It's brief compared to eternity. There's not even a definition that is described how brief it is. However, from the dot, if you extend the line, it goes on forever, which I did there on the board. That line is eternity, which Christians will spend in heaven. Well, in other places too. Right now, we're living in a dot. But what are we living for? The short-sighted person lives for the dot. Go back on the board. This is, like I said, this is your viewpoint. This is your life on earth. This is what you're living for. You can't comprehend this. So you don't, what you're saying, you don't trust and you don't faith. 
that is or have faith that this exists if this is the only viewpoint you have you're pretending to be a christian here because you can't comprehend this what jesus says trust him and if you trust him this exists and if this exists he's telling us to put our treasures here not there come back to me The short-sighted person lives for the dot. The person with perspective lives for the line. The, this, sir, in our time here, is the dot. Our beloved bridegroom, the coming wedding, the great reunion, our eternal home in the new heavens and new earth, they're all on the line. The person who lives for the dot lives for treasures on earth that end in junkyards. The person who lives for the line lives for treasures in heaven that never ends. As I preached last Wednesday night, the inexhaustible treasures. That never ends. Giving is living for the line. We'll each part with our money. The only question is when. We have no choice but to part with it later. But we do have the choice of whether to part with it now. We can't keep earthly treasures for the moment. And we may get some temporary enjoyment from it. But if we give it away, we'll enjoy eternal treasures that will never be taken from us. Foolish people live for the dot. Wise people live for the line. It's all about perspective. The believer's view of reality should be radically different than the non-believers. And believe me, this will do, even to Christians it will sound radical. And that's the preachers and the pastors to blame for because they watered down the word of God so you can accept it they'll be accountable for that imagine if you lived in Jesus day he's teaching you a concept in this case true giving here in Matthew 6 verse 19 and beyond and you take it he sent you on a mission for a few weeks. And you take that same message. And because you don't know how the crowd will react to it, because it is fanatical, if you look at it that way, it is radical, even beyond a Mosaic Law type of system of giving, you water it down. What do you think Christ would have done when he heard about it? Well, he never... He knew about it more than likely, but what do you think he would have done? We have preachers. We have pastors that only have the viewpoint of the life on earth, the dot. They don't see the ramifications of what will happen on that line. They've become myopic. And their poor excuse, well, Jesus knew I had a good heart. Foolish people live for the dot. And what's more evil Preachers have been preaching that it's okay to live for the dot. Wise people live for the line. It's all about perspective. The believer's view of reality should be radically different than the non-believers. We should live, live differently because we see differently. We witness the same current events but interpret them differently. We eat the same food, exchange the same currency, but live according to two different purposes. These purposes are based squarely on two different perspectives. One that looks at life in the short run, and the other that looks at life in the long run. When our eyes are set on eternity, the news that someone has come to know the Savior means a great deal more than the news of a salary raise or the prospect of getting the latest high-tech gadget. Of course, the salary raise and perhaps the gadget can be used for the kingdom of God. 
But the point is that neither one in itself is ultimately important. Whereas new birth, which affects the eternal destination of a precious human being, is vitally important. The Christian who accumulates land and houses and bank accounts but doesn't invest in eternity isn't depicted by Jesus in his sermon as, un as unrighteousness, as unrighteous, excuse me, greedy or selfish, though he might be any or all of these. Let me read that to you again slowly so you don't take anything I said and twist it. The Christian who accumulates land and houses and bank accounts but doesn't invest in eternity, isn't depicted by Jesus in his sermon as unrighteous, greedy, or selfish, though he might be any and all of these. Rather, he's depicted as short-sighted and blind. He is depicted as short-sighted and blind. Unwise is too weak of a word. This person is stupid. Stupid on the grandest scale. As stupid as the rich fool of Luke 12. As stupid as the man who found the treasure in the field would have been to hold on to his poultry possessions instead of trading them in for what was far greater value. And why are they stupid? According to this author, and I agree. Why are they short-sighted? Why are they blinded? Let's go to the scripture now. Before we go to the scripture, I want to go to what I preached over four years ago. I'm not going to read you the whole thing, where your treasures or where your heart is. Just read it to you a part of it. Because the answer lies in a, because you're putting your treasures on earth instead of in heaven. And there's a spiritual problem with it while you're doing it. In verses 22 and 23, shows us what the problem is. Let me go to it here. So let's read the verses again for verse 22 and 23 one more time. In Matthew 6, by the way. The light of the body is the eye. Is there, if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? I wrote years ago, or I preached, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Circle the word single. The Greek word is haplous. I'm going to go back and forth to the board, so be alert. Haplous. Haplous. I'm just going to stand here and read for a few minutes. It does not mean single. Definition is not single. The light of the body, remember verse 19 and 21, the previous verses. And all the verses after 22 are still talking about money. Still talking about money. Why should Jesus just in, one, in that one sentence divert to another subject? The light of the body, the hapless, Is the eye. If therefore that eye be haploose, the whole body shall be full of light. Haploose. The eye is the window by which light gets into the whole body. The eye of the window is how light gets into the whole body. If it is clear, it is going to illuminate everywhere. The light would be hindered if it were frosted, colored, or dirty, or in darkness. In darkness. 
If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? How great is that darkness? Now you can come back to me here in the chair. How great is that darkness? Now, you see in verse 23, you need to write this down. I'll just read, read it to you. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. Circle that word darkness. This is something I didn't cover before. What does it mean? It was a particular word used that was common to describe a certain condition, especially at night. It's so dark, you couldn't even see in front of you. So therefore, it would restrain your progress in going from point A to point B. So you can put there, therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. Why? Because you've been restraining or stopped because you've been overcome by something. In this case, how it is used in the general population by darkness. And that's why the King James decided to use the word darkness there. Get it, folks? You are in the dark, in other words. You cannot see the true meaning of anything, especially about giving. And you are lost. You are walking around in total darkness. Somebody else will do it. They'll catch on. They'll make up for me. No. There's you. And the Lord has given you responsibilities. And the wonderful thing about it, as we live up to those responsibilities, we have benefits. And others also have those benefits. Why? Because they're going to be rescued. And if they're taught well, they're going to carry on the same message and live the same way because they understand where their viewpoint is located. Not in the here and now, but on this line, this, this eternal line that's not short-sighted, but sees the long-term forever viewpoint. You cannot see the true meaning of anything concerning the eternal benefits that you receive, that's for sure, and others. You are lost. You are walking around in total darkness. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be hapless, the whole body shall be full of light. There is another thought in this section coming from the word in which the King James translator rendered single and the New English founders rendered sound. In some texts, the word means simple and simplicity. I go on to say, However, other texts say that the only proper translation, I searched this out far and wide, my friends, is generosity, and that's what it means. That's what it means. Generosity. Some translators recognize this truth when they came to the 12th chapter of Romans, verse 8, when they're using the same kind of language there. For in that verse, the word simplicity used in the King James Version was changed to liberality. So the text now reads, he that giveth, let him do with liberality. In other words, very generously. Some Greek dictionaries defines the word hapless as simplicity as manifested in generous giving. This verse refers to money. Not the nonsense a lot of authors and commentators like to enlighten you with this, that is incorrect. It has always been about money and possessions and, and it has always been been about how to give God's way. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye were generous, the whole body shall be full of light. Nothing is going to restrain you. Nothing is going to stop you from the act of giving. You will move forward. You will not be stopped because you can't see. You'll be seated because you'll be illuminated and... and not only you'll be illuminated, but watch and see if others don't get illuminated by what you're doing. Not to mention how much it pleases the Lord that you're being obedient to his instruction. The eye is the window of by which light by which light thine eye 
were generous, the whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye were evil or not generous, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In this particular verse, it has never been about anything except money. I look up the 26, I'm, I'm preaching this, I looked up the 26 translations Bibles. I was curious to see how many of the 26 translators would even want to deal with this particular verse. I only found two. The one translator that really stood out was Moffat. His translation is, so if your eye were generous, so if your eye were generous, why should it be generous? Because you are laying up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. If you lay your treasures up here on earth, then you are in darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be dark, how great is our darkness? In other words, the tighter your wallet and the harder you, harder you hang on to your possessions, the more darkness you will have. These are tough words, and I know they are. But what do you think Jesus was saying? You think he's just putting some fancy language together to try to confuse you? Or to bring clarity to the subject matter? These are his words, hapless, in the Greek. Generous, not single. Darkness, light. He is looking to see where your heart is, by the way, you generously give back to ministries and churches that feed you the word of God. In addition, if you do it with the right attitude, your heart is seated and centered on his word that gives you spiritual life. Then you'll be living in the light that illuminates your whole body. Let me move forward. I'm just reading you part of this message. It goes on to say, do you want to live in the light or do you want to live in darkness? That's the two choices. That's the two perspectives. One deals with the here and now only. One deals with the perspective of eternity. That line that never ends. That's here on the board. Are you accumulating riches in heaven or here on earth? You can accumulate them in heaven by giving to the ministry that gives you light. And hope by teaching the word of God, that has always been God's plan. I go on further in the message. You can read it. On, it's on the website. But I just wanted to stop and point out, there lies the problem. If you're not laying your treasures up in heaven, you've got a sight problem. You've got a viewpoint problem. You have chosen the wrong per per perspective how to view these scriptures. That's why you don't see these preached on that, that often. It makes you bring yourself to a decision point. Once you heard the truth, you either have to go about trying to disprove everything I'm saying tonight, or if you're reading this, when it becomes available in the written format, everything that you're reading. And if you can't, believe me, I wouldn't preach it if you could. If you can't, then you have to reject it willingly, which places you in darkness. In darkness. You have become your own restraining force. You have become the one that makes your life so dark that you cannot even take another step because you can't see anything in front of you except your own viewpoint, which is dark in your viewpoint, which is dark in your path. You get it, folks? Yes, it's short-sighted. Yes, you're blind. Yes, as this author says, it's just plain stupid to make that choice. The one with good eyes, the one with an eternal perspective, is accurate in his or her appraisal of what is important. Like the poor widow in Mark 12, this person is eternally wise, with vision corrected by biblical laser surgery. That's the kind of LASIK you need if you are in darkness. A biblical LASIK surgery. To take you from a blinded state to one that really does see the light.
No pun intended. This person is eternally wise with vision corrected by biblically laser surgery. I like those, those three words. In fact, I think I'm going to highlight that. Biblical laser surgery. Not only in this topic matter, but just about every topic matter. That's what we need today in these last days. Biblical laser surgery. This person sees life through the eyes of eternity. Unlike the average person, the believer stares through the haze and peers beyond the horizons of this world to another. Put it on the board. They're no longer on this viewpoint. The here and now, that dot up there where we started, they are trusting and they are fading in Jesus Christ. And they understand what he presents in Matthew 6, 19 and on. That our treasures will be stored in heaven. Not only for our benefits, because that's his promise, we will receive benefits, but what those treasures will do in the here and now for others to benefit the same way. With the most important benefit, receiving salvation and grace by Jesus Christ alone. And if you have that viewpoint, you're no longer stuck in this box, in this dot viewpoint. You are now in this line, this line of heaven, which has eternal viewpoint, which has the life eternal viewpoint. You are in hapless condition because you recognize one of the reasons why you were called and chosen in the first place. And it takes you out of that in darkness state, that state where you've got to stop you have to restrain yourself because you're afraid of going any further because you can't see where you're going. Because the very next, you're only in the, in fact, you're in the worst state of mind because you're in the here and now without going either forward or backward. You're stuck. You might be in that lukewarm condition as a Christian. Come back to me. The choice is yours, folks. I'll present you the truth. Go try to disprove it. I challenge you. These are not my words. See, I know once I start preaching on New Testament giving and start peeling off the layers of Old Testament giving, which is just the standard, it's going to affect some of you. And some of you are going to rebel. Some of you are going to tune out. And some of you are going to open your heart. I've already seen some of those results like you've never had before. The question is, well, the statement is, you have two perspectives. The question is, which one are you going to choose tonight? To be continued, pray this way.